They are known as two members of the infamous axis of evil. One, Iran, which has recently entered into talks with the world's superpowers to curtail its nuclear ambitions. The other, North Korea, with nuclear weaponry of its own. Since its nuclear tests and threats last February, the Hermit Kingdom has recently test-fired short-range rockets. Are these two nations still the nuclear bad guys? Joining us now to help answer that, Ramesh Thakur. He is director of the Center for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament at the Australian National University. And we welcome you back to Canada. Thank you, Steve. We remember well when you used to hang out in this part of the world, but you left, what, two years ago? Uh, three years ago. Three years ago. How many trips back to Canada since? Uh, this is my second, I believe. Second time. Well, welcome back. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Let's just share with you and our viewers some of the details of this agreement with Iran, and then I'll get your views on how that's going. Mm -hmm. This is the, the makings of an agreement here. Iran promises to halt production of near 20% enriched uranium and disable the configuration of the centrifuge cascades used to produce it, not construct additional enrichment facilities, not go beyond its current enrichment research and development practices. Iran is to agree to cap to a cap on the permitted size of Iran's up to 5% enriched uranium stockpile, allow the IAEA, the inspectors, to visit the, Nant the Nataz and Fordo enrichment sites daily and the Iraq reactor at least monthly. Now, on the other side of the coin, the so-called P5 plus 1, they promise to provide, quote, limited, temporary, targeted, and reversible sanctions relief. They promised to transfer more than $4 billion of oil revenue to Iran in installments. They promised to suspend sanctions on Iran's imports of exports of gold and other precious metals. License the supply of spare parts and services for the safety of flight of Iran's civil aviation sector. And facilitate the establishment of a financial channel to support humanitarian trade already permitted with Iran. And facilitate payments for UN obligations and tuition payments for students studying abroad. That's what the P5 plus one so-called promises. Okay, that's the outline of the deal. How significant do you think it is? I think it's pretty significant, but it's not a game changer, uh, nor is it a critical threat. Uh, what it does is, well, for one thing, it's temporary. It runs out uh, mid-July, July 20th, I believe, uh, is the exact date. They are hoping to make it permanent, and there's other things that they will look to uh, in the permanent deal. What it did was two things. It put a hold on Iran's continuing weaponization capability acquisition with regard to materials uh, and various other uh, things. And it put a hold on threats of strikes, military strikes, uh, by some powers in the West, uh, as well as relief from uh, limited and targeted uh, sanctions worth about, I think, $7 billion altogether from 80 to $100 billion in the total package that are being affected. What prevents this temporary agreement from becoming permanent, in your view? The, the real critical issues will come now in terms of the putting figures on some of these items that were there. Uh, for example, uh, what will be the cap that we want for its enrichment facility uh, and material? It, it's got about 8,000 kilograms at the moment, I believe, of enriched, that's 5% enrichment for some material. Uh, by the way, it has been cooperating on reducing the highly enriched uranium, the near 20% that was on the chart. Mm -hmm. it, uh, in February, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, reported that that had gone down from um, about 196 kilogram in November to 161 kilogram in February. This is the first actual reduction in four years. And so that's itself a measure of significance. And that is significant. It is significant because you need approximately 250 kilogram of that HEU uh, for, one, for the core of one nuclear warhead. Hmm. Now, 20% doesn't give you that capability, 90% does. But the transition from 20% to 90% is actually a very short one. That's so that to go from 0 to 20 takes a long time. 20 it's to 90... It's more difficult uh, and right. than from 20 to 90. Gotcha. The Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, has called this interim agreement, quote, an historic mistake. Do you agree? No. As I said, I don't think it's either a historic breakthrough or a historic mistake. It puts a pause, uh, even if the agreement lapses in July, we will effectively have delayed the weapons acquisition time frame by Iran from two weeks to two months. What we would like is to have about a 12 month period. Uh, there's two things. One is we want to be able to detect any move to get weapons. And then we want to be confident that after we detect it, there's still 
a reasonable period for us to react to that. So I, I think uh, this does not undermine either of these in any respect and may, in fact, increase our abilities. Got another quote for you. This from Senator Mark Kirk, the Republican from Illinois, who said beginning January 20th, this administration will give the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism billions of dollars while allowing the mullahs to keep their illicit nuclear infrastructure in place. Your comment on his view. Well, <laughs> on the first part, uh, we are not giving them anything. We are releasing what are their funds. Let's be clear on that. Okay. Uh, on the second part, no, that's simply not true. I think what we are trying to do is cap the existing situation, see if we can make the cap permanent, and seek reductions, actual reductions, in the fissile material they have, in the enrichment, uh, open the facilities and plants to inspection, uh, get their agreement under international verification and monitoring uh, so that they cannot restart it. Uh, I think these are positive signs. Uh, if, it, it, if it is made permanent, it's a win-win outcome. Uh, and it's, it's a great uh, achievement if you can get that made permanent. Uh, Russia is a part of the P5 plus one. Russia has its hands full these days. Russia is heavily focused on Ukraine at the moment. Is that ultimately a problem for this agreement insofar as Russia may not be able to be as focused on this as it probably should be? It could be a problem. I don't think it will be a problem because Russia has other preoccupations or is not focused enough. It could be a problem if Russia reacts to increasingly stringent sanctions on Russia for its behavior in the Crimea by withholding cooperation on other fronts. I think Russia's capacity to achieve its goals internationally beyond its immediate neighborhood is very limited. But its capacity to make mischief on the range of other issues is very high. Having said that, can I just add, it is not in Russia's interest that Iran become a nuclear weapon state. Uh, I think Russia and China have also made it very clear they would not be happy with that, and that's why they have cooperated. So I think for Russia to withdraw cooperation would be self-defeating from their own interest point of view. I wouldn't expect that. How about from the other side of the coin, which is the other members of the P5 plus one are so angry at Russia right now because of Ukraine. Could that become an irritant to getting a deal done? It could be. I, I think there is a risk of uh, rhetoric beginning to catch up uh, and entrap us in terms of our own interest. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand, I, I think we need to just sit back calmly and think it through. What are our vital interests? What are Iran's vital interests? What are Russians, Russia's vital interests? Beyond that, what are other things we desire and they might desire? The desirable things we can compromise on. Vital interests we shouldn't compromise on. We have to be clear in our own mind about bottom lines without advertising it openly. But acknowledge they also have those. If we do that, then that the other side of that is we have to stare down critics domestically about compromising on the uh, expendables or, or peripheral things whilst taking to the very core bottom lines. Let's move from Iran to North Korea. Not mm -hmm. that long ago, North Korea launched 25, 25 short-range rockets into the sea. When you heard about that, what did you think? <laughs> it's North Korea being North Korea. It, 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 it's a... Uh, its missile technology is not all that serious as yet, uh, and, and, and its ability to marry nuclear warheads, to mount nuclear warheads on missiles, uh, it hasn't got that yet. We, at least we don't believe it has that. It's trying to get there. It hasn't got there yet. It, they're unreliable. They're not very accurate. Nobody knows, though. No, Nobody really nobody, knows North Korea's well, nuclear capability yet, do we? We make reliable guesses. guesses. And, and yes. Mm -hmm. I think the worry is where they will go from here rather than what their present capability is. Hmm. What, do we have any... Does anybody have any reliable information on how many nuclear warheads they have? We believe they have between 4 and 10, and they have about another 45 kilogram of plutonium, which is enough to make uh, another up to another 8, I think. Uh, if they begin re restart the Yongbyon reactor with its enrichment facilities and plutonium separation facilities, then uh, with the 8,000 fuel rods they have, I think, uh, at the end of one year of running those, they will have another six to seven kilogram of uh, plutonium that they can harvest from that, which again is enough to make approximately one bomb per year. That's their capability, which is very limited, as I said. Public opinion on these countries and some of the other countries around the world that are making headlines for a lot of the wrong reasons is fascinating. And I want to share with you, you look at the monitor here in the studio, this is Gallup. The Gallup polling company conducted a survey earlier this year on the countries that Americans consider to be, quote, their greatest enemy. And look at the change from 2014, present day, from 2012. China seen 
as a little bit less of a threat, North Korea seen as a bit more of a threat, Iran seen as significantly less of a threat, however Russia seen as significantly more of a threat, and Iraq seen as about the same. Uh, the numbers for Russia jump almost uh, four and a half points. So um, it's always a bit dangerous to you know, try and glean what's in the public's mind when they give these kinds of answers. But what do you take from that? Oh, well, a couple of things. One, the public opinion poll will react to events in the immediate uh, period preceding the poll. Uh, two, the Russian thing is from a very low base. So it's yes. still only in single figures. Mm -hmm. But it is true that under President Putin, uh, Russia has been announcing that it's back. Uh, we saw it rescue President Obama from a red line of his own foolishness on Syria uh, last year. Uh, and then he's taking these actions now in the Ukraine, saying, you know, there's a limit to how much we are going to be pushed around. There is certainly the perception that uh, the United States is still in the midst of that slow but steady relative waning of its ascendancy and primacy that it has had since the end of the Cold War. Uh, and therefore, there'll be probing maneuvers from various other countries. Uh, it also, of course, the public opinion depends on where you take it. I, I think just about all around Asia and the Pacific, you will find China's uh, is being perceived as an increased threat uh, compared mm -hmm. to two years ago. If you were surveyed and you were asked which is America's number one threat at the moment, what country would you have put on the list? I'm not sure I would put a threat, but I think the central geopolitical dynamic of our time is the China-U.S. relationship. No, that's fair, but I'm going to still push you on this because uh, the question well, was... Threat to well, whom? the question was, who's public enemy number one for the United States For today? the United States. Yeah. Uh, United States, at present and for the foreseeable future, the only country that could destroy the United States with nuclear weapons is, is Russia. Between them, they have about 8,000 nuclear warheads each. Between them, together, they are gone for 95% of the total global uh, nuclear uh, arsenal. So, yes, that... It has the capacity to destroy the United States. China doesn't have, well, China's got about a couple of hundred, uh, but they're not really in the same league in terms of the strategic reach. Regarding North Korea and Iran, both those countries have two relatively new political leaders on their respective scenes. Does that change at all how we view the respective threats of those countries? Yes, it does, uh, but in opposite directions. In Iran, we had... Uh, uh, a good imitation of a buffoon uh, in Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Uh, and uh, I don't think there were too many Iranians impressed by him either. Uh, there certainly seems to be a serious intent on the part of his successor, President Rouhani, to reset relations with Europe and the United States. Uh, how much space he will have from the Ayatollahs? Uh, can he carry his uh, country and regime if, if, if he gives in too much? Uh, is this all a ploy? These are questions that will be answered, but I'm glad that they made the contact around the margins of the United Nations. Uh, I'm pleased that Senator Kerry met his Iranian counterpart, uh, Foreign Minister Zarif, uh, and even happier that President Obama reached out and made the telephone call, and we've seen the results from that. So let's test them out in terms of how far they prepared to go. You sound in somewhat more hopeful, though, on that front. On, on, compared to North Korea, certainly. Yes, okay. In North Korea, it's the other way around. We've got a very young, very inexperienced uh, Mercurial leader who seems to be following the strategy of his father and grandfather of ratcheting up escalations, then calibrating a wind down in return for concessions or status or uh, aid or whatever. Uh, I'm not sure he has the skills. That's a very high risk strategy. It's very easy for things to go wrong through miscalculation, misperception, miscommunication, and it is a very volatile region. So that would worry me in that sense. In between the two leaders, yes, I'll be more worried about the North Korean. What do you think, as, a, as part of the sort of foreign affairs expert community, when you see the former basketball player Dennis Rodman going over and having very high-level talks with Kim Jong-un? Celebrities will be celebrities. But is it serious? I don't think so. Because certainly Kim wants I, it to I, be serious. He wants it to be serious, but if you want a serious uh, report, uh, much more serious than that, uh, is the UN report recently comparing the North Korean regime to the Nazi regime. Uh, the inquiry team that was chaired by a former uh, Supreme Court, uh, High Court, as it's called in Australia, Judge uh, Michael Kirby, which is very sobering and very damning and saying, you know, we've got to do something about it. The stories that team heard 
uh, from various people. It wasn't allowed to go to North Korea, but it's not because it didn't want to go. Uh, that's a, from a very credible source, a pretty serious comparison to the Nazi regime. Hmm. Uh, that, that's very worrying. How much do you worry about what's happening between the Russian and American relationship today? It is worrying. It, it's part of a gathering trend of reverses from the benign environment that we've had for the past couple of decades. Uh, on the one hand, across Europe, uh, across the Atlantic, Russian-American relations seem to be cooling. Uh, can I say that I don't think that's going to lead to a new Cold War? Because if you look at the three defining features of the Cold War, there's no way in the foreseeable future Russia is going to be a global military challenger to the United States primacy. There's no way that uh, communism as, as an ideology is going to reemerge to challenge the supremacy of liberal democracy. And there's no way that the command economy of socialist economics is going to reemerge as a credible challenger to market principles. So it's not going to be a new Cold War. It doesn't mean there couldn't be a chill in relations uh, between the United States and Russia and across Europe. Uh, then, of course, as I said, on the other side, that there's China, but that's a different question. Right. I want to quote you back to you. Here's what you told the Japan Times uh, in the middle of last year. Some answer by branding Iran and North Korea, quote, rogue regimes. Such demonization has two negative consequences. It adds to their paranoia and deepens their determination to strengthen nuclear weapons capability in order to complicate the calculus of anyone seeking regime change. And it makes it difficult for us to craft political responses to the security dilemma or seek a reconciliation based on some compromise and mutual accommodation. The only acceptable goal is complete rollback, not containment based on deterrence. Okay, if, if calling somebody a rogue state is now a bad idea, how do we go about identifying these powers while responding to their nuclear issues? Well, again, we go back to what I said earlier. What are our vital interests? What are things that we'd like to do but are prepared to compromise on? Mm -hmm. uh, does it help in the world of diplomacy by labeling any countries or regimes rogue? It helps um, in local politics. Often. Well, it, of course it does. Uh, but then, you know, do we accept that Putin is justified in Crimea because it has increased his popularity? Every country, every leader has local politics to consider also. What we're talking about is these are countries, they are problem countries. Uh, does the world believe that it was helpful to anyone's cause for President Bush to have identified three countries as part of the axis of evil? I don't think it was. It, it, it complicates relations unnecessarily. Uh, you know, Ambassador Brahimi talks about the need to have to shake hands with the devil. These are people in power. You're going to have to negotiate with them. You don't negotiate with friends. Well, you do on other issues, but not in terms of uh, con peace. conflict and, and peace yeah. and war issues. So Canada doesn't negotiate with the United States over peace between the two countries. Uh, unless you have decided that war is the only option and you're going to go down that path, which in today's world is going to be very high cost, you are going to have to talk to them. If you're going to have to talk to them, you make it more difficult for them to talk to you by labeling them rogue uh, or worse, and you make it difficult for yourself in terms of your own domestic politics to talk to them. Compare Obama and George W. Bush in terms of raising or lowering the temperature, therefore allowing a more fertile ground for negotiations. How would you compare the two? Well, I think Obama has certainly been a marked improvement in terms of a more emollient style of foreign policy and diplomacy. Uh, the, the question about him that, that people ask, and I guess legitimately, is whether he's gone too far in the other extreme. Someone with a loud bark and a very soft stick, uh, and, and that is a risk. Uh, his phrase, leading from behind, uh, act, I think actually it makes sense. Uh, but it may not be the best strategy always. He does seem to have a personal predisposition not to get engaged with an issue, whether domestic or international, until it has reached almost crisis point. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure that that's very advisable either. Let me ask you one last question. You're in the disarmament business. You would like to see a world, I presume, where nuclear weapons are no longer a threat to destroy the planet. Can you imagine that happening in your lifetime? Well, it's been happening. We had more than 70,000 nuclear warheads in 1986 at the peak of the period, uh, that down to 17,000 and below uh, today. So it has been happening. The danger at the moment is, while nuclear weapons don't define the relations between Russia and the United States, there are more countries that have them. 
there are non-state actors who are interested in them. And the prospect of nuclear weapons being used in a regional context today are higher than before. So we are still very much uh, on the edge of the nuclear cliff. It may not be as steep as it used to be, but the consequence, consequences uh, would still be pretty fatal. So yes, I would like to see that happen. I think it is happening. The trend lines are good. There are other things that could be done within the near and medium term. Uh, and in the long term, which I hope will be my lifetime, I'd still like to see them eliminated entirely. It was a simpler time in the Cold War in some respects, wasn't it? Yes, but it wasn't a better time. Not a better time, but a simpler time. A simpler time. Gotcha. Uh, Ramesh Thakur, the director of the Center for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament at the Australian National University. Good to have you in our studios again, sir. A pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to be back. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.